Let's bring in senior writer at the Australian, Troy Bramston, for his thoughts on the events of the day. Troy, what did you make of Anthony Albanese, his appearance on the program a bit earlier? He's fired up and he's got his position out there two years out. Is it the right way to go in terms of making his case? He says the detail will come on the roadmap they're going to consult over coming months. Yeah, Kieran, I know you don't need me to say this, but I thought he was uh, a little bit petulant and a bit uh, angry and a bit uh, dismissive of a number of your questions. I didn't think he came across all that well, actually, because he tried to keep putting the focus back on the government. The government's trying to put the focus back on him, and I really do think he needs to outline a pathway as to how he's going to achieve this target under a Labor government of Nero Z emissions by the year 2050. Now, I support the target. 73 other countries around the world support the target. The business community supports it. It makes sense. There is a rapid decarbonisation of the economy going on anyway. Uh, and uh, we know that the cost of renewables are coming down and some of the evidence is that um, renewables could make up, make up about 80% or more of our energy supply by the year 2050. But it is incumbent upon Labor to show how this plan would be, would be, imp would be uh, implemented. That is, the impact on the economy, um, the impact to the budget, uh, what it means for jobs, what it means for industries, and Labor just hasn't done that. So I think it's a highly risky move by Labor to put this out there so soon into a new term, given that the party's own review of one of the reasons why they lost the election showed it was uncertainty about the Adani coal mine and its position on climate change. And in terms of that detail, it's not just about the modelling, is it? It's, uh, it's very much about the specifics when you're talking about jobs of the future and that sort of thing. That it just needs to have more more detail, doesn't it? Well, I, I just think it looks a little bit sloppy, uh, Kieran. I, I think here we, here we see the opposition saying we've got this target, uh, which they've seized upon because there is a lot of support for it around the world, but the governments that have signed up to it have detailed plans to achieve it. You know, he, he, even Boris Johnson, you know, is going to phase out the combustible engine, I think, by 2045 and introduce electric cars. That's just one pathway as to how a Conservative government abroad is going to achieve it, mm. but we've heard next to nothing um, from Labor at all, yet they're yeah. also saying that we're going to continue to see um, coal exports. Uh, they've ruled out an emissions trading scheme. So I'm not sure how they can get to that, get to that point. They want to keep putting the pressure on, on the government. Um, but for a lot of people out there who hear a Labor Party talking about ambitious climate change targets, that to them means higher power bills. It means their jobs will be at risk. Mm. And I think it just shows yet again that Labor seems to be almost too green on this issue, too alarmist, too panicky. I think, I think the, uh, the climate emergency motion that Labor sponsored through the parliament last year was another tactical error. And a, a lot of voters are willing to look at climate mm. change and see that it's an important issue and the economy should transition to decarbonise, but they want to know the details as to how this is going to happen and yeah. what it's going to mean for their bills and for their jobs. I, 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 quite, I like the idea in a political sense, uh, Troy, of trying to make your vulnerability a strength and take it head on and, and, and convince people of the case, but it, it just needs more substance does it in terms of how to get there. But I, I, I take the point that they say we're going to negotiate, we're going to liaise with all of the other groups that support us in this. That's something that they've got on their side, the fact that multinationals from Santos, BHP, BP, AGL, they all back the idea, as does the BCA, as does all the states and territories. So, and as you mentioned, Boris Johnson, uh, you know, the, the Tory Prime Minister. So it's not like they're out on their own on this. No, but I do think here they've, they've sort of put the cart before the horse. Um, they've come up with the end point without working out how they're going to get there. Um, and they're putting, trying to put pressure on the government. Well, if you're going to come out with a big policy like this, uh, you've got to identify how you're going to achieve it. And I just don't think they've got the detail there. We're going to see, we're going to see some more movement in this space from the government with their, with their technology future plan. Um, and looking, looking at that later, perhaps mm. later this week um, or next week. But 
you know, I, I, again, I don't know why Labor would make themselves the issue. And we saw the government hammering them on this in question time today. I, I guess that's kind of to be yeah. expected. Um, but climate change was a net negative for Labor uh, in the election. I mean, there's no doubt about that. I mean, I had Labor candidates. You interviewed them. I spoke to them. Labor candidates, yeah. Labor MPs who were saying they couldn't explain Labor's climate change policies. They couldn't explain how they would achieve those targets, what the cost would be to the economy or to the budget, what it would mean for jobs. And yet we see Labor back mm. now in this same position that they were during the election campaign that caused them so much grief. Yes, they'll get points, I guess, if you look at that, for being bold, being ambitious uh, and being serious about climate change. But that's only part of the equation. The other part of the equation yeah. is, is how you achieve it. Indeed. And, well, as you said, other countries that have, have made similar commitments have got a, a lot of detail out there. We saw the ABC a foreign correspondent story this week on, on Germany, which had Germany's providing a $7 billion compensation for the corporations affected by 2038, yep. when they're shutting down the coal industry, basically. $65 billion for regional um, funds to come up with a new generation industries. We're not talking about shutting down the industry, but as you point out, the, it by the time we get to the next election, if it's going to be a credible position that the government won't continue to maximise their political attack with, there will have to be some substance. Yeah, there will. Um, and that is why I think Labor should have taken the opportunity to develop some policy pathways before saying they commit to the goal or, or do both uh, at the same time. And they decided not, not to do that. Um, on the other, conversely, on the other side, I, I think the government will come under some significant pressure to commit to that 2050 net zero emissions uh, target because so many other countries have, have committed to it. The business community here have committed to it. And mm. when they go to the Glasgow Climate Change Conference put on, of course, by the UN in November, there will be pressure on the government uh, to have met that target. And so the government is now trying to work out um, themselves how they're going to uh, possibly deal with that issue of whether or not they support the target or not. And if they do, because I think there'll be significant pressure on them to do that, how they can outline yeah. to their own constituency how they will achieve it. And, and also some inconsistencies uh, in terms of the, the attack on the, the Labor approach from within, well, certainly the NFF, as Mr Albanese pointed out there, they're talking about in their roadmap for 2030 net neutrality in terms of carbon emissions by 2030. So uh, in, on the one hand, they're criticising Labor, but within their own planning document, they're talking about being carbon neutral within 10 years. It doesn't stack up. Yeah, well, that's, that's, of course, the farming sector. And see, what, what, I think what's happened over the past 10 to 20 years or so, Kieran, is there's been so many changes in national climate change policy. You know, prime ministers have lost their jobs. There have been policies that have been supported uh, and then abandoned. Even Labor now essentially supports uh, the former Turnbull government's uh, national energy guarantee. There's been so much mess in this space, so much policy uncertainty coming from government that a number of industry sectors have decided to act on their own anyway. Um, and so there is already a rapid technological yeah. advance going on in the economy. We've seen significant uh, progress with renewable energy sources and costs come down. Um, and, of course, some of the big emitters themselves um, are leading that charge without government. But, you know, we, we could become an energy uh, superpower. We could, be, we could lead the world on climate change reductions if we only had that significant leadership at the government level, and I think also a degree of bipartisanship as well. Uh, but what we're seeing is a number of sectors, whether it's energy, whether it's uh, farming, whether it's tourism, uh, whatever it is, uh, a number of these sectors are moving ahead uh, to decarbonise their, their footprint in the economy, whether or not government is setting the right price signals or not. Troy, appreciate it. We'll talk to you later in the week. Thanks very much for that. Thanks, Kieran.